President Biden is calling on the intelligence community to step up its efforts to figure out the origins of COVID-19. The virology lab in Wuhan led some to suggest that the virus was man-made or had accidentally escaped. also gained further attention this week because of a number of U.S. media reports. China has denied the possibility. State media calls it a conspiracy theory. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we don't cover the news. We cover the way the news is covered. Here are the media stories we're examining this week. Natural emergence or laboratory leak? There are competing theories on the origins of COVID-19, and one of them is attracting more and more coverage. Don't cross the red lines. When Pakistani journalists do that, they end up in trouble. They will not be erased. The museum in Hong Kong that's contesting the official Chinese narrative on Tiananmen Square. And showing symptoms of the post-pandemic blues. You have saved so many lives. Who's really ready to leave their face masks behind? A year and a half into the pandemic, and one of the first questions asked about COVID-19 is making a comeback in the news coverage. Where exactly did the virus originate? How did it come to be? The theory that it was born in a bat, possibly transmitted through another animal, and made its way to humans in Wuhan, China, remains the scientific consensus. Recently, another theory, initially dismissed, that the pandemic started at a laboratory in Wuhan after the virus accidentally leaked has reemerged, to the extent that the White House now wants that idea reinvestigated, and soon. Beijing rejects the hypothesis outright, but gives it life, raises suspicions by denying investigators the kind of access they want. No longer seen as a fringe conspiracy, the so-called lab leak theory is gaining momentum amongst some scientists and journalists, some of whom contend this story has the makings of a cover-up. But how much evidence is there that humans gave the virus its start? The answer is not much. Our starting point this week is the Institute of Virology in Wuhan, China. So how did we get here? How does a theory come back from the dead? The lab leak theory, which was previously hawked by conspiracy theorists, might actually be credible. How did a scientific hypothesis that was always tinged with politics, that COVID-19 was born in a Chinese laboratory, make its way back into the mainstream? Everybody starting to change their tune on the likelihood of the lab leak COVID origin. Yes. How did it jump from the fringes of journalism, outlets like the Washington Times and Breitbart News, to the pages of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal? President Biden has told intelligence agencies they need to redouble their efforts. And why would President Biden, who dismissed the theory when it was being touted by his predecessor, be ordering his intelligence officials to investigate the idea all over again. This is a weird situation where it feels like the media is almost creating the media. So an article will come out in the media and then other people will write about what came out of the media. So it's not so much that there's new evidence, but there's a lot more articles coming out suggesting other putative ways it could have been from the lab, whether it's created or was leaked accidentally. I don't think the conspiracies ever went away, but from a scientific perspective, these arguments seem to be relitigating the exact same pieces of information that we've been discussing for the last 18 months. That's why when I see these headlines, it seems to me more about this ongoing desire to have a, a solid answer rather than necessarily anything new that we've learned. We've also seen a lot of research coming from people who have existing beefs with mainstream scientific consensus to write about this. For instance, climate denier Matt Ridley in the UK for The Spectator. Nicholas Wade, who wrote a book that was widely condemned for its racism um, about genetics. A book that incidentally makes startling claims about Asian culture and science. So without going to ad hominem as such, we can say that the credentials of some of the people who are being leaned on here are not great. It's been that way since the start. The born in a lab theory was not helped by some of its proponents. Have you seen anything at this point that gives you a high degree of confidence that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was the origin of this virus? Yes, yes. I have. Yes. When reporters heard Donald Trump oral. talking about it, they filed that away, along with things like Trump prescribing Americans drink bleach as a COVID cure. And then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out 
in a minute. Or his Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, playing the blame game. Remember, China has a history of infecting the world. There was a kind of doubt by association that some have since inverted. Yes, I think a lot of people have egg on their face. This to some things may be true, even if Donald Trump said them. Nevertheless, the ex-president did some long-term damage to the lab leak theory, which its advocates, controversial figures like Nicholas Wade, have had to contend with. The general hypothesis of the lab leak is that uh, the virus escaped from the laboratory in the middle of Wuhan, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, where we know that they were studying coronaviruses. We know they were working in rather low-level safety conditions, and so it would be no surprise if such a virus had escaped. As to why uh, it has been ignored for so long, the public narrative was seized right from the beginning by two small groups of virologists who published letters in leading scientific journals, The, the Lancet and Nature Medicine, poo-pooing the idea of lab escape, saying it was an absurd conspiracy theory. Now, these two letters should have been challenged by the mainstream press. Conspiracy theory is, is a divisive word. You know, it's condescending. It will only inflame issues. But I think it's really important that journalists when they hear that scientists are now saying there should be investigation, to not take a leap and say that now means there's a lab leak. Scientists will always say more studies are needed. That's every story I cover, there's always more studies needed. They don't have all the data they want. That doesn't mean that um, something's true because there's doubt doesn't mean that something's true. The Wall Street Journal investigation recently is a great example. It said that three people in China from the Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, had attended a hospital in November 2019. But that's not really new evidence saying that there is a lab leak. That's just a vaguely circumstantial piece of information that doesn't really prove much either way. The deeper one digs into the lab leak theory, the clearer it becomes. There is no smoking gun. But news, like nature, abhors a vacuum. And Beijing has helped create one by making it harder to investigate. President Xi Jinping's government kept the UN's World Health Organization informed of the outbreak in the early stages, in late 2019, but has been far less open to allowing WHO investigators to see the lab for themselves. The WHO did make it into Wuhan in January, and although there was never a likelihood that its scientists would be able to prove that COVID emerged naturally, from animals to humans. When they didn't, the advocates of the lab leak theory jumped on that and convinced many news outlets to follow. The uh, WHO commission to uh, uh, Beijing uh, was very important because it set the stage for this sudden change of opinion. What became clear was that the Chinese authorities had not a shred of evidence to offer the commission in favor of natural emergence. If you look at this episode, you see a much more detailed and deliberate attempt to, to suppress all information about the virus. So here's the thing, from the start, we've needed to investigate this further. It's a remote possibility but it's a, a possibility. The problem is that China will not allow that. This would be the case no matter how the virus originated. Even if the Chinese authorities had footage on tape of some random market worker being bitten by a, a bat and immediately sneezing. Um, it is the very nature of the CCP system to thrive in secrecy. Any discussion of a lab leak seems to come back to uh, China's fault. People want to lay the blame on a specific group of individuals and that poisons the well and that sensationalism has kind of infected the discussion because we're now relitigating the exact same points that we were discussing in February, March 2020, except now it's saying, oh, the, the discussion has reignited, even though it kind of hasn't. For journalists, a lot depends on getting this story right. The organizations they work for, like the governments they report on, need their publics to trust them. The geopolitics makes some of the reporting prone to sensationalism. 
The modern day economics of the news industry, the clickbait requirement, do not help either. Ultimately though, it comes down to the science. What does it say? Nothing absolutely conclusive. But the absence of any real evidence that COVID-19 leaked from a lab is evidence of a kind that there's nothing to see here. And as scientists and journalists working on past viral outbreaks have learned, it will take a while, years probably, before we get the certainty we crave on how this pandemic got its start. And remember, this is effectively SARS-2. Um, the first SARS traveled over a thousand miles from uh, Yunnan to where it was first detected in Guangzhou. It took us 14 years to piece together the complete pattern um, of how that transfer uh, occurred. But we've seen a big push recently to claim that there is more evidence along these lines of stuff that frankly has largely turned out to be bullshit. As humans, we like binary choices. It's either a lab leak or it's not. And the fact of the matter is that we simply do not know. And we may never know. It may be like Ebola 44 years into the future and we still aren't sure precisely where this virus came from. And the challenge is how do we uh, communicate this to the public to say that even if we don't find a, a smoking gun for a natural origin, it doesn't necessarily make the alternative any more likely or true. Uh, all it means is that we still don't know. And communicating uncertainty is one of the hardest things as scientists that we can do. And I think it, it will remain a challenge moving forward. Journalists in Pakistan have been speaking out. Some are paying the price for that. One was assaulted at his home last week. Tarek Nafa has been following the story. Tarek, what can you tell us about the case of Assad Ali Tour? Tour is a journalist who used his YouTube channel to scrutinize the Pakistani government and military. He says three men who identified themselves as intelligence officers turned up at his house, tied him up and beat him up. He says he was told the ISI, the Inter-Services Intelligence Agency, and the military were, quote, not happy with his journalism and asked him why he named the ISI in his reporting. The Pakistani authorities have denied any involvement and claim that Tour faked the attack so that he can claim asylum abroad. And now a journalist who has spoken out against what happened is facing the consequence. Yes, during a protest in support of Tour, one of Pakistan's best known TV presenters, Hamid Mir, implied Pakistan's powerful military establishment was responsible. So, this is why I don't know that I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't that speech went viral, and Mir has now been taken off the air at Geo News. He'll no longer host the show Capital Talk, but he says he won't be silenced. This is a man who's already survived an assassination attempt for his reporting. He was shot twice back in 2014. We covered that story back then. But this, what happened to Mir, it's part of a larger trend in Pakistan. That's right, Richard. And even before Prime Minister Imran Khan came to power in 2018, journalists were speaking out about censorship, about increased fear and intimidation. But things have only got worse since then. In July 2020, TV journalist Matiala Jan was abducted, gagged and beaten. And just a few months ago, another journalist, Afsar Alam, was shot and wounded close to his home. No arrests were made in either case. OK, thanks, Tark. It's been 32 years this week since one of the biggest pro-democracy demonstrations mainland China has ever seen came to a violent end. And it remains a story that most Chinese citizens know very little about. The Tiananmen Square protests began in April 1989. They were led by students. For nearly two months, hundreds of thousands of people would take part before the military was called in. To this day, we still do not know the exact death toll, and that is by design. The country's communist leaders have tried to erase the Tiananmen Square massacre from China's history. Survivors have been scared into silence. Merely referring to the date, June 4th, 1989, can land you in jail. Dissidents outside the mainland, though, are doing what they can. Take the June 4th Museum in Hong Kong. Its raison d'etre is to educate visitors, including those from the mainland, on what really happened in 1989. 
The Listening Post's Johanna Hoos now with a story about memory, history, and official attempts in Beijing to bury the past. June 4th, 1989. A date China's Communist Party has tried to erase from the country's collective memory. Overnight, thousands of pro-democracy protesters were gunned down in Beijing on the orders of their own government. It became known as the Tiananmen Square Massacre. Stories from that day, memories, have been preserved in a museum in Hong Kong. I started the idea of this uh, June 4 Museum uh, during the 20th anniversary of the uh, Tiananmen Square Massacre. Because at that time, you know, we can see a whole generation of young people not knowing what happened in 89. The people of China are completely blocked from understanding what happened. We want Chinese uh, people coming to Hong Kong uh, to visit this museum so that they can go back to the 1989 uh, democracy movement. As somebody who grew up in China and went through the education system, the first time I got to know the event was in high school, and there is one sentence in my history book which said, uh, around the summer and spring of 1989, there was a student protest and they created a disturbance. A lot of mainland Chinese, they go to Hong Kong and they would visit the museum because that is the place that you can uh, see all these images that depict what had happened. And the museum provide this space for you to understand it on a more personal level. The Tiananmen Square massacre brought a lethal end to weeks of mass demonstrations. They started in April when university students met to commemorate the death of the Communist Party's former chairman, a reformer who had been ousted by hardliners. The gathering quickly grew into a protest about freedom of speech corruption and economic and political reforms. On April 26, the Communist Party published a front page editorial in the People's Daily, calling the movement a premeditated conspiracy with an anti-party, anti-socialist agenda. That editorial backfired. It galvanized thousands to join the students, but the government did not back down. That's when we decide to uh, hold a hunger strike. And the media in China, they turn on our side. Those journalists must have felt that we, the young kids, were dying for, you know, the freedom that they, as an older generation and journalists, should fight for themselves. So when that news spread all over the country, the movement uh, spread from Beijing to about 200 cities. We were summoned to the great hall of people by the premier. I was the uh, head delegator. And then he gave a long monologue criticizing the students. And then so I decided to interrupt him. No communist leader have ever thought they could be dressed down by some 21-year-old like that in front of the whole world. That was the time the government decided to crack down using military force. And I'm told a number of people died this ruling communist party would take whatever action is needed to hold on to power. First of all, it wants to eliminate this from people's memory. Secondly, from the party's perspective, this is an, an anti-government, anti-state action. So whatever step that it is taken is totally justified. For most of the last 32 years, the story of the massacre has gone untold in China. And that's the way Beijing wants it. Today's students will find no reference to it in their school books. The media is firmly under party control, 
and the dissonants that remain in China have been silenced. Even the mention of the date can result in a prison sentence. There are lots of people that try to commemorate June 4th inside China and being arrested. And therefore, the only counterbalance of their official narrative is to do it outside of China. So that people in China, they can come to Hong Kong to this museum. Uh, we have a, a USB a video recording uh, of the massacre and they can bring it home. And we are trying to do that to, to break that um, uh, censorship inside China. In China, there's no Google. If you try to search the word Tiananmen, you won't find it. It's just trying to make the whole country forget. At least if they cannot make the people who participated, who witnesses the 1989 student movement to forget, at least they were hoping the younger generations can forget about it. Activists in Hong Kong are making sure they won't forget. For 32 years, every June 4th, they've held vigils to commemorate the victims. But under the leadership of Xi Jinping, China has been tightening its grip on the city. Last year, it imposed a new security law which criminalizes subversion, secession and sedition against the mainland. It triggered instant protests. The museum's founder, Li Che Yun, is just one casualty of Beijing's crackdown. On May 28th, he was found guilty of organizing unauthorized protests. Combined with a previous conviction, it means he will spend 20 months in jail. The authorities are also coming for the museum. This week, police launched an investigation into its licenses. Our interview took place weeks before Lee's sentencing, when he was already feeling his freedom slipping away. The Communist Party using the national secret law, they are using it in a very arbitrary way. The red line can always shift and they can always strangle you. And therefore, firstly, we have digitalized everything uh, uh, that we have so that even if the physical museum was being suppressed, we can still continue with the online one. Hong Kong has always been a very important uh, channel for, ch for ideas, freedom to Chinese people. It's a it was a free city. So uh, millions of Chinese people go to Hong Kong, they have a chance to have some access to the outside world information. And the Chinese regime knows that little access can become very dangerous when it spread back to China. So they tried their very, very hardest to keep Hong Kong in control. In 1989, when Hong Kong was still a British colony, a million people marched there in solidarity with the Tiananmen Square protesters. In 2019, a new generation took to those same streets, now fighting their own battle with Beijing, telling China to keep its hands off their freedoms, even at the risk of history repeating itself at their expense. 32 years ago, there was, you know, people in the mainland. Uh, now it's uh, the people um, in Hong Kong. So or the party wants to take away people's right to the freedom of speech, the freedom of protest, the right to vote for their own government. All this fundamentally are the same. When you look at this artwork behind me, it's a comparison of the two movements. We want to, you know, people to feel the similarity the passion for democracy uh, of both generations. In a way, what happened in 89 sort of, you know, foretold everything. They won't tolerate dissent and democracy. And so this is very much relevant today because the fight is still on. And finally, with vaccination rates on the rise and many countries loosening their restrictions, what becomes of our closest companions in these times of social distancing? Our face masks. They've seen us through the ups and downs. They've kept us safe. More to the point, they've made us feel safe. So do we just dispense with them? 
In this next TikTok video, American actor and comedian Vic Krishna talks about the awkward breakup conversation, capturing the put it on again, take it off again relationship that many of us have had with our masks. But first a warning, some viewers may find the following video strangely moving. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Hey, can we talk? Yeah, sure. Remember when we went to Walgreens a couple weeks ago? To get gummy bears? Yeah. Well, it was actually to get the second dose of the vaccine. You're breaking up with me! It was the right thing to do. It was Pfizer, wasn't it? You mean Pfizer? Oh, excuse me! I am so grateful. You have saved so many lives. You're done with me. I'm disposable. I mean, yeah, you are disposable. But you are indispensable. There's still so many people who are not vaccinated. They still need you. I am happy you got vaccinated. And hey, I'll still need you for traveling. You know, planes, buses, Look trains. Oh, are we breaking up or not? Me too. You know what? I'll still wear you.